Good morning, good morning. Thank you so much for joining me. This is the lovely podcast, The Endurance of Labor Laws. I am your lovely host, Leslie Sullivan, and today is episode 49. And today we're going to take a quick look at the Guild of Italian American Actors. But first of all, I want to give a shout out to my lovely listeners. So let me go to my list here and take a look cuz you guys are awesome. So a big shout out to New York, Texas, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, Virginia, Indiana and Washington. God bless you guys. You guys are awesome. Okay, so I was researching this guild of Italian actors and it's small, and I think I might know why. So, let's go ahead and dive into it and then we'll circle back into why I think it's small and has not grown very much. Okay, so again it is the Guild of Italian American Actors. Um its abbreviation is GIAA. Um it was founded on December 20th, 1937. It is a trade union. It is headquartered in New York City, New York, in the United States. It has locations in the United States. As of 2013, it has 79 members. Its president is Carlo, I think it's Fioletta. It has affiliations with the Associated Actors and Artists of America. So this one is not affiliated with AFL-CIO. Excuse me, which I'm kind of surprised to see. And it was formerly called the Italian Actors Union. So it says the Guild of Italian American Actors (GIAA) was founded in 1937 as the Italian Actors Union (IAU) to protect the rights of Italian American actors in Italian language theater, and was reinvented as GIAA, the Guild of Italian American Actors, by then President Paul Borghese in 1998. Borghese served as president from 1998 to 2002. and currently serves as president emeritus. I don't know what that word means, so it might be interesting to look it up. It says here he took a dying union of 67 members to a membership of 500 actors, directors and writers. So right there the numbers don't make sense. And it says the guild has jurisdiction over Italian language professional theater and works to preserve and promote awareness of Italian culture and heritage. GIAA also provides a casting resource to directors and producers seeking Italian American actors. And it talks about the GIAA Festival of Short Films and Videos. It says GIAA Festival of Short Films and Videos was an annual film festival and award ceremony celebrating successful short films and videos as well as scripts. Winners receive awards including the GIAA Italian American Heritage Award. and awards for the best actor, actress, documentary and animation. An audience favorite award was added in 2008. In 2012 the festival was discontinued after 5 years and there is no current plan to restart. And I can understand why. There is a little bit of controversy. It says GIAA was barred from marching in the Columbus Day parade in 2002 because it refused to give to parade organizers a list of members who appeared on the Sopranos. I don't know if that's true about this, but here's the thing. So that's all the that's all the information that is available about this union. Okay. So here's the thing. It its membership drastically dropped. Looks like after 2002. Like it says it really dropped after that and then their finances greatly dropped. Like as of 2000, uh their financial records here It dropped from like I think that's a hundred thousand dollars their value. It dropped all the way down to almost ten thousand dollars, and it has never really recovered. And this has been going on since two thousand two. So here's the thing: this union, I'm surprised it doesn't have more members, but I'm also surprised that it doesn't. Because if you think about, it, this was founded in 1937. Now I don't know what you know about Italy. and their problems and their government um but if you do not know much history about Italy I would strongly suggest that you that you read up on it cuz it's kind of sad especially during the 1920s 30s and 40s okay so in the 1930s i think it's from like 1920 I can't remember the exact date somewhere in the early 1920s A very evil dictator came into power in Italy. His name was uh, I think it was Benito uh, Mussolini. They just call him Mussolini. He was a very horrible dictator. He was fascist. And from what I read, 
about him. He was raised um in a very strict Catholic home. His mother was extremely Catholic. His mother or sorry, his mother was extremely Catholic. His father was not. He was anti-clerical, so he basically hated the church. And uh Mussolini was forced to go to a boarding school and he was forced to go to mass. He did, he did not even want to go, but he was physically forced to go. So what you have to remember is that pre-Vatican II the Catholic Church was very strict and um it still tries to impose itself on people's everyday life especially within Christianity but what was really bad was pre-Vatican II which Vatican II happened I think in the 1960s or 70s I think it's the 1960s but pre-Vatican II um and what I mean by Vatican II is that the pope at that time during the 60s or 70s whenever this happened in the church the pope tried to relax the church a little bit tried to make it so that it was more understanding it was more understandable which it hasn't really changed much but back in those days pre vatican 2 the language that was spoken at catholic churches was latin it was not english so you know pre vatican 2 the church was very strict whenever you went to church it was like nobody really knew what was going on especially in the united states um because it wasn't in english so everything was in latin so it made it very difficult to participate in um the mass because you know latin is not our native language latin is not the native language of any society except maybe for rome back in greco roman times you know when you had uh, roman emperors um so anyway pre vatican 2 you had a very strict um aggressive catholic church It was not very kind to people. It just was not. It did not allow um uh, women to get divorced. It didn't allow people to get divorced even if the woman was being beaten. Um the Catholic Church has and some Catholics still have this horrible view he, even here in Oklahoma that if you're being beaten like basically getting the bleep uh being beaten out of you um that the Catholic Church doesn't think you have rights to get divorced. It thinks that you should only be married once even if that person was cruel to you. And um that's why we have a problem with annulments, especially in the United States. So, the Catholic Church is slowly coming around to the fact that people do divorce and it is their right to divorce. If they don't feel safe being married to someone or if the marriage was not valid, they have every right to divorce and the church is not God. And I'm not saying that as an atheist or agnostic or fascist or anything of that nature. It's just that the church is not God. God is God. But unfortunately, with the Catholic Church and these priests, they tried to make themselves God over everybody, and try to dictate how you raise your children, how you name them. And I'll give an example. Um, there's a lady that I know that goes to my mother's church. She's way old. She's way old, but. um she did not like this one priest in their hometown wherever she was raised because this priest if he did not like the name that her parents gave their own children he would change it on the on the baptismal certificate he's like well I don't like that name so we're going to call your child this and it's usually after some stupid saint that he thinks is great that no one else cares about and it's just like really you're going to change the name of someone else's child when it's not your baby You didn't give birth to it. You didn't have sex with this woman. Like you are not in charge of this family. But unfortunately, that's how priests behave, especially pre-Vatican II. So, I'm using that as an example to kind of give you a reason as to why there are some problems in Italy. So, Italy had a lot of problems with religion. They were hating the Catholic Church, but yet the Catholic Church, even though I don't agree with hardly anything that they do these days, especially way back then, they were pretty much the only ones that were um fighting against fascism and against the Nazis and they were fighting against tyrannical governments even though the Catholic Church is not perfect far from it it's not really I don't believe it's really Christian in how it acts sometimes I don't really think it's a great place that Christianity cuz to me it acts like a cult I don't like it per se and so um but unfortunately back when Mussolini was being raised this was the extreme cult like Catholic Church that was trying to control people's lives well unfortunately Mussolini had a very uh, anti-clerical which priests are called clerics. And so his father was very much anti-Catholic church, anti-Catholicism, anti-cleric. And so because Mussolini did not like how he was being treated at the church, much less the boarding school he was forced to attend, 
he developed a hatred towards the Catholic Church and towards Christianity. And so he basically in his heart and his soul he left the Catholic Church, left Christianity altogether. Like he didn't even just go to a different church, which probably would have been very difficult in Italy at this time because Italy is loaded with Catholic churches. Some of them are very beautiful, very beautiful indeed. And some some have some very wonderful people that attend there, but there really wasn't a thing as freedom of religion per se. I mean, they can try and say it there was for the 20th century, but um Italy was just predominantly Catholic. Like when you had if all you know is Catholicism in your country, then it's going to be very difficult to have, you know, Methodist, Lutheran, you know, all these other different denominations within Christianity. And it wasn't really tolerated in Italy to have different forms of denominations of Christianity. You're either Catholic or you're completely out. You're blacklisted. So being that Mussolini was raised in this very cult-like um manner, um he developed a hatred for the Catholic Church, for Christianity, and instead of just practicing a different type of Christianity, he became an atheist. And so he focused on um a government route, I would say. So instead of being you know Christian, he went the direct opposite. didn't believe in god he thought that anyone that believed in god was mad was crazy because he totally believed in science well that's what sucks when people are not shown the correct way of christianity like they're not really told about the goodness of god the lovingness of god they completely turn away from god and from christianity they don't ever give god another chance and so what they do is they cling to something else when the case of mussolini he clung to science and fascism like he was really a big instigator of fascism and he helped to start fascism in Italy well over the years mussolini came into power so during the 1930s he was basically the fascist prime minister of Italy at that time and he aligned himself with adolf hitler during the 1930s well unfortunately here in the united states um because of mussolini and him becoming fascist in what he believed and you know killing people and things like that and talking very horribly about Christianity and big business and things like that even though fascists they love money just as much as anybody else if not more i would say fascism i would say fascists and communists love more love money more than than capitalists because they give themselves permission to steal real capitalists do not give themselves permission to steal if anything real capitalists should never want to steal because they should want to do business with people like that's the right way to to conduct business you behave in an ethical moral and legal manner but with fascism and communism it's like all the rules go out the window unfortunately and they give themselves permission to do that by constantly playing the victim card and then playing the victim card to the masses well that's what mussolini did and that's also what adolf hitler did that's one reason why adolf hitler came to power was because he played on the emotions of the Germans. Um he claimed that it was a Germany's fault um that they got into a war for World War 1 and they should have never been treated the way they were treated after World War 1 and the Germans were treated harshly but for good reason because people did not want a second world war and the Germans were wrong to go to war both times. Both times they were completely wrong. And they did it in a very horrible cruel manner what they did to people to go to war with them. So But however, the German people never really forgot how they were treated. During World War 2, or sorry, before World War 1, during World War 1 and post World War 1. Like there was animosity there towards the rest of the entire planet, especially Europe, about how they were treated. So that's why a lot of German people and other nations as well that did not think that they they agreed with Germany during the First World War and they did not think they should have lost. So you had all these what they call it empathizers i think is what you call them their empathy is in the wrong place big time and so because hitler and mussolini played on the feelings and the emotions of so many people that were just constantly living in victimhood that's how they came to power besides killing off their enemies killing off opposition and forcing people to believe in what they believed an example of this an example of this is in the youth like when you hear about hitler's youth He had these youth camps where he had kids. Um I would say they were forced to go, but they really did want to go. They they wanted to be good little Germans, good little Nazis and plus they wanted to be a part of something that was 
um on the surface look noble you know they wanted to have that nationalism and there's nothing wrong with having nationalism but it's it's not good when it's for killing people like there's nothing wrong for example with being pro america like i'm i'm very proud to be an american but i also know that we have rules laws and regulations about how we function as a country and as and has we um how we function as a nation like just because i'm pro america that doesn't mean that i think america should just be able to do whatever it wants whenever it wants and just you know screw everybody else that that's not that's not what we believe in as a country and that's not what i believe in you know as a person like that's just not how i operate um so but unfortunately with germany and italy their sense of nationalism turned to violence And so Mussolini comes to power I think in the 20s and he's really very powerful in the 1930s and early 1940s. And um it he was he was deemed as kind of being unstoppable really both him and Hitler. Even though their their decision on what they were planning to do in war and in terms of history was doomed because if you think about it, Italy and Germany are some of the smallest countries on this planet. how they ever thought that they could rule an entire planet like our entire planet how they ever thought that their country could ever rule the entire planet is it's just stupidity i mean you'd think that if you know mussolini really believed in science believed in facts that he would he would at least look at the population density of his country and the population density of germany and realize that they don't have enough people to control the entire planet They don't. They they do not. I mean, just their neighbor Russia has enough people in their country to annihilate both of them. Like they that's one reason why Germany failed. The Nazis failed was because they could not defeat Russia. First of all, Russia has way more citizens, way more citizens, and Russia is huge as a country. And then also Russia, its ultimate weapon is the weather. <laughs> that's the biggest thing that defeated the Nazis. Like they literally froze to death. um so one of those things that's not always pleasant to think about but anyway my point is this in regards to the Italian American Actors Guild i'm not surprised their membership dropped and it never really got to be a large organization because it was founded when Italians were not treated very well in the United States and i don't agree with how they were treated if they were mistreated which i'm sure they were But here's the thing, the United States was having to deal with the brewing conflict over in Europe, dealing with um the beginnings of World War II. And during the 1930s, what you have to remember is that the Nazi party was going strong and it was growing very rapidly. And Hitler was bumping off competition, Mussolini was bumping off competition. Um so you have you have two very evil dictators that form an alliance during this time. And here's the thing, I think it was in the United States, Canada, and possibly Britain. Um there were some there were some had to sign a paper saying that, you know, if you're from Italy or if you're Italian that you that you do not support Mussolini and that you are signing allegiance to whatever country you're currently living in. And so the the non-fascist nations were having to deal with this conflict because they didn't want Italian fascists in any country to grow the fascist party within a peaceful nation because the writing was on the wall already in the 1930s especially the late 1930s that more than likely the US and Britain especially the United States they were going to have to go to war at some at some point and then when we were attacked by the Japanese um at Pearl Harbor that that kind of signed that authorization basically to go to go to war because we had been attacked um FDR tried everything that he could for us to stay out of that war he really did um unfortunately though he also practiced isolationism which doesn't work it's almost like avoiding it's it's almost like avoidance and I'll give an example let's say for example you are working in an office and someone is really mean and hateful to you. And so instead of calling them out on their behavior in a good kind way, saying, "Hey, that really hurts my feelings when you do XYZ or please don't do please don't do what you're doing to me. It makes me very uncomfortable." And say specifically what they're doing wrong, how it makes you feel and say, "Hey, you know, this needs to stop." 
because it's offending me or it's bringing harm to me, whatever the case may be. You know, if you never call them out on it or if you never report them, then all you're doing is practicing avoidance. And so that evilness that's taking place, which if someone's bothering you at work, they are being evil. Let's just call a spade a spade. Because there's different forms of evil behavior. It's not always extreme violence. But, I mean, it can be hostile work environment, which I personally have experienced, and it was hell. And I knew that person was being intentional towards me. They were intentionally being cruel to me, and that is very evil. Like, of all things to do while they're on the job earning a living... They choose to try and make my life a living hell on the clock the entire time I'm there. Like, that is very evil. Well, here's the thing. If you never call them out on it and or you never report them to management, you're doing what FDR did, which, which is practicing avoidance, and then you're isolating yourself. Unfortunately, when you practice avoidance and you practice isolationism, all you're really doing is allowing that problem to percolate. And eventually it will grow and get worse. And that's what happened um, that led to World War II in regards to the United States getting involved. And also, I can speak from experience, when you avoid something and you don't call someone out on their behavior, they just continue to do whatever they want, however they want, because they don't really value human life. And that may sound extreme, but it's very true. Because think about when someone's evil and mean to you, do, do they value your life? No, because if they did, they wouldn't be behaving that way. It's not this, oh, I didn't know BS. Like, you know, we have to call a spade a spade. Because if you don't keep it black and white, yes and no, if you live in that gray area, pretty much your rights are going to be trampled all over. And so I think that I personally believe that if FDR, if he had gotten the United States involved sooner, we would not have had Pearl Harbor. That's my personal opinion. I think he failed as a leader in terms of that situation. And that's my personal opinion, but I think that if you know that there's some kind of evil going on and we have the ability to stop it, if you think about it, we could have stopped those concentration camps back in the 30s. We could have stopped all of that. Millions of Jews did not have to die. No one should have died like that, but we could have intervened. And unfortunately, FDR, being the Democrat that he was, he was kind of arrogant as well. Uh, he had that problem, too. Um, he, he did not have this, he didn't have the courage. I don't know how to describe it. He didn't have the courage to stop it from the beginning. Stop the killings and say, hey, th this, is, this is our world, meaning a, as, a, as a planet, and we can't have these kind of killings. And FDR, he really liked the fact that we were already a world superpower at that time, But he just wanted to sit by on the sidelines and just have us make more money, but not actually go help and save people from dying. Because our intelligence people at that time, we knew what was going on over there in Europe. There may have been some hush-hush, but we knew what was going on. I mean, we, we didn't know how evil the Nazi doctors were and how they were torturing and killing people. But we were aware of some things. But we didn't do anything until we were actually attacked. See, that's, it reminds me of this guy I worked with. This is a, a good while ago. Um, he was telling me about one of the reasons why his marriage failed. And I don't know why it came up. He was telling me about one time. I think it, it, I don't know why, but sometimes people just tell me stuff about themselves. That I'm just like, where did that come from? But I guess it was one of those things that sometimes people, they feel like they need to get something off their chest. So I'm like, okay, you know, whatever the case may be. But, you know, just being a kind ear. And whatnot. And, and so he told me that one of the reasons why his wife divorced him was because his lack of action and being a good man. And I was like, really? He goes, yeah. He goes, but she was right. I, like my mouth just dropped. Like he was siding with his ex-wife on this. He said, now at the time when she said this, you know, I was pretty mad at her. He goes, but when I look back, she's right. And I was like, well, what did she say that really woke you up? That really made you think about this. And he said that his wife told him that you don't do anything to help people unless it personally affects you. And that's wrong. That's lazy. You, you basically don't stand up for what's right until it affects you. You are very selfish. And that's one of the reasons why she left him. And my mouth just dropped. And I thought, wow, that's a wise woman right there. Because I look at it this way. Like, you say, for example... You know, you're, you're married to someone. I'm speaking to the women on this. But let's say you're married to a guy. 
and you know, you, let's say you're walking to your car after a movie or something, and there there's a woman walking to her car as well, and she gets attacked by a guy or whatever, and she's being assaulted. You know, like physically assaulted, like getting punched in the face, she's getting robbed, whatever the case may be. And your husband that you're married to just says, "Oh, let's just keep walking our car. He's not doing anything to us." Now, what would that make you think about him and his character? Not much. If anything, your husband should say, "Get in the car. Here are the keys. Stay there. I'm gonna go help this woman." Like immediately, he would just be like, "I'm off. I'm gonna go help her," because she's defenseless. Think about what kind of person FDR was in terms of that analogy. FDR is basically the guy that's walking with his girl. He's got it all. He doesn't need to get involved in this little situation going on in a parking lot after a movie theater. You know, after a movie's over. He sees a woman being hurt, being violated, being assaulted, physically being robbed. The FDR way of handling that would be: it doesn't involve me. I'm going to isolate myself. I'm going to practice avoidance. So that's not my problem. Let's just get in the car and go. Now, after Pearl Harbor, FDR then was like, "We need to do something about this." Then he reacts. But there were many forms and acts of violence before Pearl Harbor happened. Our men did not need to die like that. And I don't know what you guys know about Pearl Harbor, but some of those guys, you know, besides being blown to bits on their ships or whatever, some of them drowned in their ships because they couldn't get out. So when the Japanese uh, bomber pilots, you know, they they were they were suicide bombers basically. Like basically, when they run out of weapons, these Japanese guys, when they run out of weapons in their plane, they use their plane as a, as a weapon. That's no different than what ISIS is doing or was doing. I don't know much about ISIS anymore because they, I don't hear much about them, but they're still stupid. But anyway, um, so if you were a guy on one of these ships um, at Pearl Harbor and your ship got attacked, if you if you could not jump off. And if you're inside your ship and your ship went down, you died in there. Like it's been reported that people heard tapping, because they, it was the men, our servicemen that were inside those ships, that kept tapping, saying, "Hey, I'm in here. I'm in here. Come help me. Come get me." But unfortunately, we couldn't get to them in time, or we couldn't get to them at all, because of the fires, the flames, the explosions, because we were being attacked. Now all of that could have been avoided if FDR and Congress, technically, because Congress gets involved in terms of war. But if FDR had not practiced isolationism, if he had not practiced avoidance, just think how many people would be alive and well today, and would have had families, would have gotten married, you would have had careers, would have done all these things that you and I get to do, but they didn't get to do that. So I bring this up because, in regards to the Guild of Italian American Actors, Italians were not seen as very trustworthy or good people in America, much less any other country except Italy. Because there were a lot of Italians that were fascist, and unfortunately, you know what we have to remember is that in previous podcasts, a lot of these labor unions and trade unions and associations, a lot of them have fascists and communists in them. Like that, that's just been the common trend, and that is very concerning because I can't think of a single nation on the planet that is a successful, kind, loving, um, truly free country or nation, and then be fascist or communist. Because if you think about both fascists and communists, they hate the church, not just the Catholic Church, but the Christian Church. When I talk about the church, I mean the Christian Church. Like Catholics, they try and say, "Oh, we're the church." No, you're not. Even the apostles can prove that. Like when Jesus ascended to heaven, his apostles didn't just stay in one spot. They went all over the place and founded Christianity, or they spread Christianity. That's why we have all these different forms of Christian. That's one reason I should say. That's one reason why we have all these different types of Christian churches is because of where the apostles ended up. And where they helped to establish Christianity, like the Catholic Church, its its HQ is Rome. 
It's HQ. It's not the entire planet, but that's what it tries to say. And I think that's what really pissed off a lot of people. Was the Catholic Church trying to say, no, it's all about us, and you're going to follow what we do, what we want? It's like, no, we're not doing that. That's not what Christ was about. He wasn't about people losing individuality. He was about them having freedom in Christ. He was about he was about them having freedom within Christianity. Because we know that, well, just, I can speak for me personally, that when I don't practice my faith, and if I don't believe in my faith, if I don't believe in Christ, then all I am is a slave to the world. And that may sound harsh, but it's the truth, because I have found true freedom in Christ. There is no other freedom that I want. It all comes from my heavenly Father. But unfortunately, in terms of Catholicism, the Catholic Church tries to make it seem like they are the only ones that provide that freedom. That's not true. They're a cult. All they do is brainwash people. They've been doing it for a long time, and they're really good at it. No wonder people have been leaving the Catholic Church because they're sick of it. And a big example of that, I would say,、um, would be France. We've talked about that in a previous podcast. Unfortunately, Italy has not left the Catholic Church. I wish it would, but You know, when you've got HQ in Rome in the Vatican, and that's in your country, it's probably very difficult to to walk away from something like that. And I understand that, but you know, it's really sad how cruel the Catholic Church can be to people, especially to children. And like I've met people that are my parents' age, a little bit older, a little bit younger, that they remember going to Catholic church and how cruel and evil the nuns were to them. It was horrible. It's like those women should have never been nuns. If they can't even be Christ-like, I mean, it's ridiculous. I'm like, can you? There were some kids that were treated so horribly, beaten and abused,、um, demoralized by by nuns, by priests, by the Catholic Church. So then, what do those children do? They rebel. Well, that's what happened with Mussolini. And that's really sad. And then he went the direct opposite of Christianity. He didn't just go to a different church. He went the direct opposite. He denounced his faith altogether. How sad is that? A child denounced his faith. It's it's sickening. It's horrible. But what you have to remember is that when you have a a, a particular type of religion that is in extreme control of people's lives. When someone rebels, they rebel against everything. It's not just one little facet; it's against everything. And so, being that we knew that about Mussolini, that's probably why Italians were not treated very well here, much less in the Hollywood industry. Because one reason why people moved out to Hollywood was because they would they thought they would have true freedom out there. Because they're, they're like, well, we're kind of a you know a melting pot of all different kinds and breeds and. You know, races and things like that. It, that's just how it was. But Italian American actors they they faced a lot of opposition, I imagine, especially in the 1930s and 40s, because Mussolini, I think he was、um, executed. I think it was in 45, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Both him and his mistress. Now, what I find interesting is that when I was growing up. Our history lesson was—I remember being taught this. I don't remember it from a book, but I remember being taught this by adults. Was that he was hanged? Him and his mistress were hanged from a window, from a building. But when I researched online, his his mistress and his and his、uh, he, he and his mistress and some others they were shot, and then they were hanged upside down by their feet at a gas station. And there's a picture of them. I don't know if that picture is legit because I. I Can't tell that it's them because their faces. It, it doesn't look good, but、um, you know his mistress was only like thirty three or thirty five years old, and they started dating when she was in her twenties. Like she was like twenty one or something when she started dating him. Like she was such a fool to date a fascist dictator. A fool. She died. She she died because of her actions. 
I mean, she supposedly she did marry someone else, but then she left him, of course, because she ever since she was a little girl, she was infatuated with Mussolini. I think they were like 28 years apart or something, which is absolutely disgusting. Oh, that's so gross. And he wasn't even good looking. He was like five foot seven, short, squatty, and oh, hideous. He was so ugly. But anyway, um, here's the thing. They were overthrown, him and his mistress and his followers, and um, there's a picture of them being hung upside down by their feet. And it's really creepy to see a woman in the 40s, 1940s, to be hung upside down by her feet, and it's obvious that she's dead. And so supposedly what the Amer- not the American people, what the Italian people did was they rounded him and his mistress up. and like three or four other people that were I don't know part of his group they were probably leaders or something I don't know what um but um not leaders but they worked for him and it's cuz they were trying to flee Mussolini and his mistress were trying to flee Italy they were trying to get to Spain but they were intercepted and they were executed they were lined up against a wall and shot and then their bodies were kind of their their corpses were taken from place to place and then they were thrown on the ground at this one particular place where the fascist party um had hung people the fascist party is very evil and so is the communist party it's it's not this great workers rights workers freedom kind of thing it's not it's it, it kills people literally it murders them so what the italian people did was they round up mussolini and his mistress they shot him and then uh, and their other people that were with him and um they threw their corpses on the ground at this one particular place where Mussolini and his fascist group would would execute and murder other people and so um the italian people they spit on their corpses they kicked them and they hung them up by their feet and then they stoned them they threw stones at their bodies while they were being hung upside down now this is what is taking place in like 1944 1945 Um so if you can imagine the founding of this guild was in 1937 and the American public was very much aware that fascism was a problem and they did not want fascists here in the United States because they didn't want to be anything like fascist Germany. They did not want any part of it. Can you blame them? Because they see that the terrorizing of this and that they murder people. So um anyway, So then their their bodies go missing. They they finally end up in a trunk and then um it doesn't say what happened to his mistress's body. But he was uh, Mussolini was buried in it on Mark Grave supposedly. But anyway, so you have this going on um at the end of World War II because you know that the the Axis powers that they they were losing, they had lost. And Mussolini and his mistress were uh, executed. I think 2 days before Adolf Hitler and his mistress committed suicide. So they see that their time is over and they kill themselves, Hitler and his mistress. And his mistress was young too. I mean, she was just so young and it's just like these young women, they just I don't understand how they just throw themselves at these really old men. have sex with them and realize that they don't really care about them and they die with them or they die for them like that's not a martyr's death that's stupidity it's absolutely dumb i don't get it but it obviously is a problem especially back then um but anyway so you have mussolini and his mistress are executed you have adolf hitler and his mistress that uh, commit suicide this is 1945 so being that we know that those are the world events meaning that would have been known all over the planet of what was going on and that world war 2 had come to an end and that the access that they they lost the allied the allied forces won so i'm not surprised that the italian american actors guild did not grow very much at all and still does not grow and they still have some problems because they're still not growing and they have some financial losses but i'm not surprised because there are some italians that are fascist i mean all you have to do is go to italy 
and see how their country is run. I mean, they have socialized medicine. It's a complete failure. And that's one reason why so many people died of COVID over there. Their healthcare system can't handle anything. Even back in the day, it couldn't handle much of anything. It can't even handle the common flu. So I think I've said this before, but um, years ago, my mother and I went on a religious pilgrimage. This was back when I was Catholic. I've since left the Catholic Church, but we went on a religious pilgrimage to Italy years ago. And um, it was absolutely beautiful, wonderful trip. But one thing that really got my attention Excuse me, was the fact that the Italian people hated their government. Excuse me. And so um, they were striking over the high gasoline prices because the government over there is in charge of the fuel, which sucks. It, it just skyrocketed the price whenever it wanted. And then um, their, their government is completely and utterly in control and sadly in control of their health care. And one of the people that was in our group... Um, they got lost, but it wasn't their fault. So we went to this one, I'm trying to remember, this one cathedral or something. I can't remember what. We had a, a tour guide. She was an idiot. She was pompous. It's obvious she hated Americans. I'm like, why do we hire people that can't stand us? Like, just get, get, I didn't listen to her. I was like, I don't want to be insulted. Like, she looked down on us. She talked down to us. It's like, really, like, we're the ones that are giving you money. Like, we're helping you have a job, so show some respect. That's what I really wanted to say, but it's like, well, whatever. That's that idiot's problem. And she was obviously an Italian, Amer- she was Italian. This woman that was our tour guide, um, she hated us. She's Italian, and um, she just, like, we were pom- like we were just ignorant um, Americans. She was pompous. We were not. Now, our nice tour guide, that was the tour guide that was showing us the sites. Our tour guide that actually traveled with us, she was sweet. Her name was Pat. She was Italian, but absolutely a sweetheart. See, that's the thing. You can have opposites within your country. But anyway, so the, the tour guide that was not nice to us, she totally messed up our group. Like, she, she told us one thing. She said, well, when you're done looking at this, well, let's just meet at the bus. Well, then she changed the directive and said, well... Um, when we're done looking at all of this, let's just meet at this fountain. Well, she told one group one thing, another group another thing, and I said, screw it, I'm going to meet up at the bus. I was like, because I want my seat. Because I didn't like sitting at the back of the bus because it's very nauseating. Because this bus, I, I don't know what it was, but it just was not, I've ridden on buses before, and this one, there's just something about the way it rode, it made me really sick. So I had to sit towards the front. So my mom and I get done looking at everything, so we head on back to the bus. Well, people followed us, most of, most of the people. Well, there's this one couple that didn't follow us. They, they listened to what that stupid tour guide said, and they met at the fountain. Well, nobody else met them there. So they got stranded. They got left behind. So then we go on on our tour guide or on our tour bus, and we go see this other stuff, right? Well, we noticed, well, actually, we didn't notice until we got back to the hotel that there's this one couple that wasn't with us the rest of the ride. <laughs> and what was funny was um, our tour guide that was from the United States, she was a total, it rhymes with witch. She was a total B word. And um, she was just using us to get a free trip to Italy. This tour guide that was from our state, from Oklahoma. And so um, she, that was one of the few times she did not do a roll call because every time I, we got on the bus, she would do a roll call. Well, when we left that one cathedral or whatever, that was the one time she did not do a roll call. Actually, she didn't do a roll call the rest of the time that day. So that's why we didn't know until we got back to the hotel that that one couple was missing because when we got back to the hotel, they were already there waiting for us, and they were pissed off. They were angry. And I don't blame them because they missed out on all this other stuff that they, um, that they paid to see. Well, the lady told us that um, they were trying to figure out where everybody was. So they figured out that they got left behind. And so um, they were trying to figure out where to find a taxi. They were trying to figure out how to get back to the hotel because they had no idea. They don't speak Italian. They're not familiar with this part of Italy. None of it, right? So they go into a hospital thinking that they'll get directions there. They were horrified at what they saw. And this is way pre-COVID. I think this was back in 2000. This is 2011. It was 2011. So they walk into this um, this hospital thinking that they'll get directions and 
They thought that their hospitals would be nice over there because Italy's beautiful, it's very touristy. No. Their hospital was so gross, so disgusting. Um it was socialized medicine, it was chaos. It was not run very well at all. Like they were horrified at what they saw. So, um the people in the hospital they said, "Hey, well to get a taxi, go out, go down this road, go here, here, you know, like leading them to where they need to go." And they told us that you know they did finally get a cab and the cab driver you know brought them back to the hotel and she told us that man if you you do not want to get sick here in Italy because their hospitals are so horrible it was shocking what they saw and it was socialized medicine she said you don't know she was yes we're irritated about what happened to us about us getting left behind uh but what was funny about that was that they yelled at the two priests <laughs> that were on our trip. <laughs> they blamed the priest. I'm like the priests were not in charge of this trip. They were there as, you know, tourists as well, you know. I thought that was funny. They got yelled at cuz one of the priests complained to me about it. He goes, "Yeah, they yelled at me." I was like, "Can you blame them?" And he goes, "Well, it kind of made me feel like a failure in terms of a shepherd. I lost two sheep." <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, you did. Way to go." But anyway, um, my point is this. Um they uh Italy has socialized medicine and this couple saw that and you know they were kind of elderly and they said man this is the last place you want to get sick don't ever get sick in Italy they're like you will probably die here like they're not prepared for anything it was really weird and, was, and she and they told us they said you know Italy may be beautiful but their country is so horribly run it is really bad so um i mentioned that because there really is nothing new with Italy and the problems that it has I don't think it has a horrible leader like Mussolini anymore because I think the Italian people learned their lesson with that. Um but they're socialized. They have socialized medicine that they have a socialist re- regime which is borderline fascist. And they're just a very combative people. Like I think I said this in a previous podcast when my mother and I were in Italy on that same trip, we went to Pompeii, which I love Pompeii. I so want to go back and look at the um, archaeological digs over there. It's absolutely wonderful. Um but anyway um we were walking around Pompeii and I noticed all these young people walking around and they looked like they should have been in school like middle school or mid high you know and um I asked the tour guide the nice tour guide the one that was really kind to us I asked her I said can you go ask those young people why they're not in school and she said sure so she goes over there and asks them why are they not in school and oh man they gave her an earful not mean or anything but Italians are very vocal And so uh um, that's one reason why I don't date them. Like they can be very good looking, but they're they're just too combative and I don't like yelling by any means. But anyway, um and plus Italian men are very bossy. They're almost like Muslim men. Um but they just dress nicer and they smell better because of the cologne that they wear. <laughs> but anyway, she goes over to these kids that obviously should have been in school and they tell her that they're striking. They went on strike. I'm like What? I was like they're not in a labor union. I was like what do you mean striking? And I guess they were mad at the um the minister of education because she wanted to privatize education over there because the education system in Italy totally sucks. The socialist government had been in charge of their education for years and their 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 students were not really able to keep up with the rest of uh, other school systems in Europe, much less the United States, and they were falling behind. And so one thing that the minister of education is a woman what she wanted to do was privatize it that way it would give parents the opportunity to pick and choose which school they send their kids to so basically if they don't want their kid to go to a crappy school they don't they shouldn't be forced to send their kid to a crappy school well unfortunately the teachers found out about this they brainwashed the kids and said no 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 you should want privatization that's just what america would do that's capitalism capitalists are evil evil they only want your money don't give in to this be italian show your nationalism go on strike with us So these teachers got all these kids to go on strike with them when in fact these teachers are part of the problem. If anything the minister of education was trying to get these kids a better education so that way they could go to a school where they can actually get a better education and get into better colleges. But because um these teachers were socialists, possibly fascists, um uh, they didn't want change. They just want same old same old and at the at the cost of kids not getting the proper education. Now if that's not selfishness and if that's not greed I don't know what is. So my but my point is this, Italy has come a long way from uh the Mussolini years as they call it. But 
for the purposes of this podcast and what the Italian American Actors Guild went through, I'm not surprised that as of 2013, they only have 73 members. 73. I mean, just think about how many Italians we have here in the United States and then think about how many Italians we have in, in film. There, there's a lot of people that are Italian that are in film. I mean, it's, it just kind of, or actors in general. I mean, it just kind of surprises me that more are not in this guild. Um, but they obviously are not financially stable because their, their monies have just plummeted. It, it hasn't done well at all. It just has really dropped extremely. Their financial records, it's been really bad. Um, but anyway, in regards to, to this particular um, trade union, it's very sad um, that the numbers are not there. Because I think that Italian actors probably were not treated very well here in the United States. Because of what was going on internationally. So that's probably one of the reasons why... They founded this guild was to help secure them employment, help secure jobs for them. Um, you know, it's kind of those things that, you know, when World War II hit, um, Germans were treated really horrible um, in the United States. Um, Japanese people were treated really bad in the United States. Italians were treated really bad in the United States. Um, there were even some Polish people that were treated really bad, and people from Czechoslovakia. Like, if you had anything that sounded like a German accent or Italian accent, you were treated not very good during World War II and even after World War II because the United States it didn't want fascism or communism here in the United States. So they were... I'm not excusing the behavior of the United States in terms of how some of the citizens behaved, But you have to really think about just how evil fascism is and was, especially back then. Because when you have fascism that just runs amok and gets too powerful, it shouldn't have any power, actually. Fascism and communism, they should be dethroned immediately all across the board because it almost always ends up killing people and slaughtering them, just the ones that we know of, uh, slaughtering people, that is. But um, the United States was fighting for democracy, was fighting for freedom, And they, they wanted to stop the killings that were taking place. And so they did not want to take a chance of these spinoff groups growing and getting numbers in the United States or Canada or other places as well. Because what's interesting is that fascists, they love freedom too. And they love money as well. So where do they go? They go to very rich countries like the United States. And then they recruit. So that's one reason why... Um, groups like this, I would imagine, guilds like this for the Italian-American actors, I imagine that's probably why they didn't grow very much and why they have just plummeted in numbers as well as in their financial assets. Um, so that's kind of concerning, but I understand why. But I think that you know, if they want to grow, my idea would be to just say you know, that you're not fascist and, you're not com and that you're not communist. And that you don't practice that. Like, focus on your heritage. Like, the Italian people are very much a beautiful people. They have a great heritage that goes way, way further back than just World War II, World War I. I mean, the Italian people, I mean, th there are Italian scientists, philosophers, um, physicists, chemists, physicians. I mean, there's, there's so many things that Italians have done for our world. So I think to only focus on one little bad part of their history as a nation and as a nationality is completely wrong to do that. Um, I think we've come far enough away from World War II and from the 1930s that, that I don't think that when you think of Italians that you immediately think of Mussolini, per se. Um, I think that if you've just recently studied something, you might think of it. But I think it's important for people to move on and to seek something better. And I think the way that this particular trade union can grow is if it would contact every Italian actor that's, you know, in L.A., New York, you know, the, the two big cities there, and just invite them. Invite them to join the union. Invite them to join the association or whatever. But really make it clear what your directive is, because it's not clear from their website what the directive is. Um, I think it needs to be reformulated. And I think one of the problems is that, see, sometimes Italians, they just like to argue, but they don't really like to get anything done. That's one reason why I don't date Italian men. 
Um, they're very good looking, very attractive. Some can be very sexy, but they they just like to argue all the time. I can't stand that. It's like when are you going to shut your mouth and actually get to work and like get things done? Like I just I just don't get it. It's it's just too combative. And it just raises my blood pressure. I don't like and I'm young and I don't like feeling like that. Like it raises my heart rate. I'm like I don't like being around that and that's not very healthy to be around people that yell all the time. But I do think that in terms of this particular guild and association or trade union actually um that they need to kind of reformulate if they want to grow members, grow their numbers um and have better financial assets, stronger financial assets, a stronger por- portfolio as they say is to regroup and reformulate. You know, what what is your intention? What is your what, what are the causes that you support? You know, what do you want to see happen? Because at this point I don't really see where they're actually doing anything to promote themselves or to promote the right things. And that's that's that that's just a problem. I don't I don't know how else to describe it, but if people don't know what you stand for, especially when it comes to organizations like this, they're not going to join you. And you know, I bet one of the excuses if they were to reach out to me and say, "Well, there aren't that many Italian American actors." I got to call BS. I got to call the bull card on that because there are a lot of Italian American actors. There are a lot But I think that this trade union has failed. To me they get an F because they have failed. I don't think there's necessarily discrepancies per se. Um I just think that they probably have a bad habit of just arguing too much because that's how the Italian people are. I mean, and we saw that with their young people when my mom and I were over there in 2011, like when I was their age, you know, like middle school, high school or mid-high is what we called it when it was like 9th and 10th grade. I didn't even know who the superintendent was in my area, but these kids knew who the minister of education was in their country. But I guarantee you their teachers made them aware of it and brainwashed them. See, that's that's concerning to me. Oh, I'll mention this as well. So, I remember um my mom and I we would get up early in the morning and then uh um, you know get ready, go eat breakfast and then we'd come we'd go back to our room. you know to get our bags ready to to move on to the next hotel or you know to the next site or whatever cuz we 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 saw a lot of stuff in like a span of like 2 weeks it was a very intense vacation it was not really a vacation that's why it was a pilgrimage um it was very much um it wasn't touristy it was like you're on the move and so i'm never doing that again <laughs> never never it was not peaceful at all um anyway i would turn on the tv just to kind of relax of course it's all in italian which was fun it was really neat to learn the language that way But what was funny was was that they had crappy dubbing. Like they had Starsky and Hutch, like the original American television show. And they they dubbed it and they tried to change their mouth to move with the Italian words and it was so funny. And then they had these Italian uh game shows. We we watched those at night, you know, if it wasn't too late cuz sometimes we wouldn't get home till really late from traveling. And their game shows are just pathetic. the Italian culture over there. Um you always have some really hot looking woman over there with huge boobs, um like just insanely huge. Um like just gorgeous makeup. She's an Italian model basically. Long brown black hair, it's probably dyed. And it was just it was just kind of degrading to women. I'm not against women looking beautiful. That's great. I think that's awesome, but it's just like you you're just selling sex basically on your game shows and it was the crappiest game show I'd ever seen. I mean the only reason why that that game show sold was because of the of the sex pot woman on on the show. That's that was really the only reason why. Like it like if you took away the 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 model that was on the show, you wouldn't really have a show. You would just have some not very good looking Italian guy hosting a game show with some Italian citizens that um they're not the cream of the crop in terms of their citizens um and what i mean by that is that um not very many italians are good looking they're just not and when i was over there um they uh some of the young people they they look they try to dress like little models i mentioned that earlier but that's just the way they dress they dress really well but i mean it just was not i was not impressed with it 
I just really was not. It's not the same as like going to the beach or something and you see a whole lot of beautiful people. It's not like that. Um there's this one lady that was on the game show whenever she would whenever she would be thinking about an answer to something she would swallow. She would swallow a lot. Well, whenever she would swallow, her neck would greatly expand almost like a fish. And my mom and I when we first saw that, we went, "Wow, what was that? What happened with her neck?" It was creepy. It was so creepy. It was like a fish neck. I don't know how else to describe it, but I mean, it was she reminded me of like a pelican. I think that's what it's called whenever they 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 get a fish and they hold it right there and their bill, beak or neck or something. That's what it looked like whenever she swallowed and we're like, "What is wrong with her neck?" It was creepy. So we stopped watching that show while that woman was on there. But um it's kind of one of those things that the only reason why Italy really has any money and which it's in debt, it's like Greece, but not as bad as Greece it hasn't gone bankrupt, but the only reason why Italy has money is because of tourism and hospitality. Otherwise, they're not really that successful as a country. Like they've never really left their fascist roots, unfortunately. Um Fascism grew tremendously in Italy in a really bad way. And so what they did instead of going, you know, to democracy 100% or to capitalism 100%, they went to socialism. Which is why their country fails at so many things. Like I've never heard of Italy coming out with a new drug that just saves a lot of people. I've never heard of um them having a great market. I've never heard of them having a great stock day or something on like the New York Stock Exchange or something like that. Um I've never he- heard about them ha- having a lot of import or exports. I've never heard much about their gross domestic product. Um they still have problems um with um what's it called? The mob? Is that what it's called? Those Italian families or whatever, like the Godfather kind of stuff. I can't think of the right words. But um I came across a documentary about one of the touristy kind of places over there and there there are so many houses in this one area there are huge houses and you think it would be great to live there but it's not they've had to put put up walls and you know around their vineyards and so this guy that was there interviewing them asked you know hey how come every single vineyard has these huge walls some some walls are really pretty but others are like a compound and they said that they've been having problems with the mafia that's the word sorry I couldn't think of it the mafia Um the mafia there in this particular area is still going strong unfortunately and one of their initiation processes to bring someone in the mafia or to initiate someone in their family is to set a vineyard on fire and to kill some people and this is like the um the late or early 2000s this is happening i thought that is so sick like how dumb can they be like you're not the godfather like you're not <laughs> This isn't a movie. This is real life. But they still have that problem there. And then they they're still having a problem with knockoff wines. So the mafia, they love money too. Big time. And so what they do is they they try and have their own vineyards. They they set other people's vineyards on fire so that way their vineyards are like the only wine coming out of that area. But then they put like a fancy label on their bottles but then they're putting really nasty gross wine in it so it's uh, it's a black market basically of wine over there and they're also doing that with olive oil i learned that because i was cooking with olive oil several years ago and i would always i thought oh i'm going to buy the italian brand i'm going to buy that cuz that i i've been to italy i know their olive oil is the best uh, that's a lie um The the Italian market is so corrupt in terms of its goods. Like you don't really know what you're getting anymore. An example of this is when COVID-19 hit, especially when it hit in Milan or whatever. Like you think you're getting these couture Italian bags and goods, but really they're not being made by Italians, they're being made by Chinese slave labor and that's how COVID got into Italy and spread all across Europe was because communist China made a deal with socialist Italy and imported slave labor Chinese slave labor like these are real people like Chinese people they were imported into Italy and they were living at these compounds in Italy making these expensive Italian goods and the craftsmanship is not there but yet they're still charging the Italian price 
Well, that is nothing new. Like Italy is very corrupt and very crooked. Like it's it's very shady over there. And so back to my olive oil example, like I was cooking with olive oil and I noticed it wasn't cooking right. I was like this doesn't taste right, it's not cooking right. So I was like, well, maybe it's just a bad batch. Maybe it's just a bad bottle. So I went back and I got a different um Italian uh brand of olive oil. It was still bad. And I was like, you know, I'm just going to ask like if these bottles of olive oil are going to cost this much money and it's not really much better than like using Crisco or something, then I'm just going to go with plain Jane American olive oil because it tastes better, it's consistent. You know, sorry, it's not non-GMO, but whatever, you know. And then the olive oil tasted normal. My cooking oil tasted normal when I just went with an American brand. And that was very sad to me. Then I find out, you know, later in this Italian documentary that there is a black market on wine and olive oil and that who knows what they're putting in some of this stuff because it's not um what's it what's the word? Not investigated. Ah, uh, what's the right word? I can't think of the right word, but whenever you have a product, it has to pass the test, inspected or whatever. I'm 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 missing the right word, but you know what I'm saying. Um quality control, quality inspection is probably what I'm trying to think of. Um the Italian government doesn't properly regulate its um olive oil industry or its wine industry, and they're not verifying that what's in those bottles is what they say it is. Like I'm not for government intervention and every little thing, but at least in the United States when when we put a label on something, we mean it. we mean it. Like you have to prove with with a inspection of what's going on with that. Unfortunately, whenever the United States does business with other countries, we don't always know what we're getting because we're having to rely on that country that we're doing business with to do the right thing. And that's really sad. Excuse me. So I just think it's one of those things where we have to be careful who we do business with, but we also have to move on. Like if something's not working out, move on, C- cut your losses and move on. I'll give another example of where we don't really know what's going on. And I'll say this in close. Um, I watched a video of rep not, not represent Senator Warren and um she was interviewing someone at one of her committee hearings I forget when it was and the name of the person but it was about quality control uh, in regards to the FDA and um she mentioned that I can't remember what year this was from but at, whenever this was taken whenever this was going on this committee hearing um at that time the United States um 40% of our generics were being manufactured in India And unfortunately, India can be a very dirty place, unfortunately. And I don't mean that negatively, it's just that they don't practice the same safety mechanisms mechanisms that we do. And she brought up some really good points. She said that um when it was investigated, like in regards to certain drugs like Lipitor and there are some other ones that these factories where these generics were being made, um there was urine on the floor. it was overflowing actually in parts of this factory where these prescription drugs were being made it's not just lipitor but others there were some drugs that had glass particles in them um they were contaminated and there was something else that she mentioned but that's 40% of our generics that are being mass produced in india but yet they don't have the same quality standards as the united states so i mentioned that because you have to be careful who you align yourself with and who you do business with it's no different than with doing business with italy but you know it's unfortunate in regards to pharmaceuticals because what i found interesting was that there are so many companies they're just like the middleman like those um almost like third party administrators no that wouldn't be right well that might be the right term holding companies that's what i'm thinking of so there are holding companies that we talked about this in another podcast that they kind of act like the middleman or they they act like they are the person that you're doing business with. So some of these holding companies act like they are the pharmaceutical company but they're really not. So they're headquartered in the United States but yet their manufacturing process processes can be in India or Croatia because one time I had to get a prescription for something I can't remember what 
And my medicine, it's, it said it was made in Croatia because I like to see where stuff is made. And I'm like, Croatia, that's very concerning. That is very concerning. Like, why can't we have drugs that are made in the United States, Germany, Israel, the U.K., like better countries, like cleaner, safer countries? Like, we, we need to be very careful about what we are consuming. Like, I find it interesting that people are very concerned about what they consume in terms of restaurant food. But yet they're not paying attention to what they're putting in their bodies when it comes to medicine and where it's being made and manufactured. So what I like to look at, like whenever I get a prescription, this is just a side note. Whenever I get a prescription, I like to look and see the label on the bottle and then the readout information that gets stapled to your bag because it tells you the name of the drug manufacturer. So what I typically do is I look up the drug manufacturer and I want to know where is this drug being made because I want to know what kind of quality controls and policies they have in place. And India does not have a lot of these policies in place. It's very unfortunate. Like they want to get in on, on the drug market, but they don't have the cleanliness to do it. They don't have the policies and procedures. They are not like the United States. They're not like the FDA, the Food Drug Administration. They have completely different standards. In their country, it, it didn't handle COVID-19 very well at all. It was horrible for them. But also, they predominantly have socialized medicine, which, again, doesn't work. So the United States had to send help over there. Well, just look at how huge India is. They have a huge population in India, but yet they're not a world power. They want to be one, and I don't blame them. But their, their government, it's, how do I word this? They're not doing things right. It's very unfortunate, and it, it punishes their people. Like, they still have villages over there that do not have access to a hospital, much less a doctor. So they have a lot of these remote villages that they just put a nurse there. A nurse can't deliver a baby. A nurse can't remove an appendix. And they're very uneducated nurses. And, I, you know, nurses are awesome. But they are not an MD. They're not a DO. They're, they're not educated like what these people need. You know, let's say you have a farming accident. You know, let's say you, you live in a village and you're a farmer and you have a farming accident and you almost cut your leg off and so your leg's just hanging there. Do you really trust a, a nurse to be your surgeon and your anesthesiologist? Like that's what I'm saying. Like their country's not run well. It's, it's, not, a world, it's not a world power. It's not a first world country. It might be a second or third, but it's not a first world country. And that breaks my heart because I've met some wonderful people from India. They're great. They're kind. They're wonderful. But in terms of how their country is run, it's not run very well. And it's socialist. It's, I mean, it's, it, it's not – I mean, Italy is run better than India. I'll say that. But, you know, Italy has a lot of corruption big time. And so my point is this, is that, you know, when you have trade unions like this Guild of Italian-American Actors – I would say the biggest reason why they haven't grown is because of lack of leadership, lack of having a direction. Because look at it this way. Even the mafia has leadership. Even the mafia has a direction. I mean, their direction is to screw people over and steal and steal, kill and destroy, basically, much like the devil. But, I mean, that's just what it is. But, I mean, I think sometimes we Americans, we really, we really put on our rose-tinted glasses and think, oh, Italy is so beautiful, the architecture. Like, it reminds me of that stupid idiot girl I worked with at this one office. She loved to brag about how she did some of her studies over there in Italy. I was like, yeah, you were there as a tourist and you were there as a student. You did not live what those people live in. And she was just like, oh, we should be like Italy. I was like, oh, poor, broke, socialist, horrible health care. No, thank you. She's like, Leslie, you just don't know. I was like, actually, I do know. I do know. And that was before I even visited Italy. I was like, you're just an idiot. Like, you, you don't pay attention at all. Like, of course you lived in a very beautiful place. Of course you had access to really good food. You're a tourist and you're American. Most of the Italian people don't have access to, that, to those beautiful things that you had. She was a moron. More than likely, she probably married some really rich guy. And yeah, just knowing how her path probably went... She probably found some really rich sugar daddy to marry and probably is having a really good, rich, fancy life with fake nails and a tan. But she's probably still very ignorant and stupid. I mean, it's just one of those things. Like, she was completely oblivious 
to the pain and suffering that was going on in Italy while she was studying there. And I think she studied there for like a year or two. I'm like, how can you live somewhere that long and not be aware of what's really going on in that community, in that society, in that town, in that city, in that country? Like, she, it was all about her. The arrogance. It's just like, wow. Like, she makes Americans look so bad, <laughs> so stupid, so foolish. But anyway, um, my point is this in regards to this, is that I really think that this trade union has not grown because it lacks leadership, it lacks initiative, and also they they really need to change how they operate. And also they need to work on letting go letting go of the past and move to the future. Because I think they missed a golden opportunity because when I look at their numbers in terms of you know like their their membership, I would think that they would have been able to recruit a lot of people in the 30s and 40s but in a different way. My idea would have been yes, we're Italian Americans, but we're pro America. We're not for Mussolini and this should be an opportunity to say, "Hey, we stand with you America. We are Americans. We have a right to work here and we love America." That's what they should have done, but I don't see any evidence of that. And I think unfortunately the reason why is because fascism and communism infiltrates and sometimes you have fascists and communists that start these trade unions. And it's almost like having the mob start a parent teachers association. It's what it's like. It's like having the mafia start the parent teacher association. It just doesn't work well at all. But anyway, this is a long podcast, um but I will go ahead and end it. We we discussed a lot for sure. But let's see what the next one's going to be. The next one will be the Bakery Confectionery Tobacco Workers and Grain Millers International or International Union, known as BCTGM. So let me take a look at that one. That one was started in 1886. This is really interesting. Their emblem. I really love that. So but anyway, um, I will go ahead and let you guys go. But until next time, I pray that you're happy, healthy, and whole, and that you have a wonderful day and a wonderful week. Thank you so much. Bye bye.